Ever since I was five years old, I, I knew what I wanted to do. And I remember that because one of my first days at school, the teacher asked the class, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I gave an answer to which she replied, sorry, darling, you can't be one of those. You're not a girl. What I said was, I want to be a naturalist. But she misheard me. She thought I said, actress. <laughs> and my colleagues had a similar reaction to yours. And that's why I remember it. I've always been attracted to biodiversity, wild species in wild places. And what first brought me to Vietnam in the early 90s was the discovery of the Saula. The Saula was remarkable, not just its size, but the fact that up until the early 90s, no scientist knew of its, knew of its existence. And this is a picture of the Saula. What I can also say um, is that this was considered to be one of the frontiers for conservation. And we were right. And since then, over a thousand new species have been discovered in the Mekong region. And that region makes up of Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand. But I think it's also fair to say that species or biodiversity isn't evenly distributed around the planet. Some places are more blessed than others. And the tropical belt that circumnavigates the globe, the equator, really is the best indicator of where you're going to find most species. Borneo, Amazon, Congo. These places conjure up an image of wild, unexplored, vast areas. And the Mekong is part of that. But if I was asked to define really what characterizes the Mekong region, it has to be the river that runs through it, the Mekong River. It starts its journey in the icy caps of Tibetan Plateau and winds its way down through the lower Mekong countries before finally discharging into the sea in Vietnam at the Delta. Along its journey, it takes on many different forms. It starts off cold, it heats up. It expands at one point to 10 kilometers in width, containing many islands, channels, flooded forests, deep pools 80 meters deep. And within that mosaic of different habitats, it's given rise to the richest river in Asia in terms of fish biodiversity. There are more species living in that river than any other river in Asia. And it's second only to the Amazon in terms of its fish biodiversity. It truly is globally uh, significant. But I would say that. I work for WWF. What does, that, what does that mean in other terms? Surely there are other ways in which a river can be viewed. And one of those ways is some of the, the major species that live there. It's a prehistoric river. It's a very old river. Some of those species that live there are relics of a olden times. It's still free-flowing in its lower section, and it has given rise to some truly incredible species, such as the Mekong giant catfish that weighs up to 300 kilos, but it's a vegetarian. Also, the world's largest freshwater fish, the Mekong giant stingray. This is a baby. This is only two meters in diameter. They get up to five meters in diameter. So it really is a truly extraordinary place. But for the people who live there, seeing these species are rarities. What they see on a daily basis is the fish that they catch and the fish that they eat. 60 million people depend on the Mekong River for daily source of protein or livelihoods, whether they're fishermen or, or consumers of fish. I don't think anywhere on the planet is such a strong link between a river and a people as what we find in the Mekong River. So biodiversity, fish biodiversity, translates directly and affects directly the lives of people who live in the Mekong River. Globally, this is significant. Just have a look at this map here. More fish is coming out of the Mekong region than North America, South America, and Europe combined. It's almost the same as the freshwater catch out of the African subcontinent. So clearly, this river system has something special. It has something that's unique. And it has something that's unique to the people that live there. That's another perspective of the river. Another perspective is that when somebody looks at that river and they see this huge, powerful surge of water, they look at it in terms of energy. 
and hydropower development. And for the last 50 years, there has been a plan that has been on the table to dam the mainstream of the Mekong in 11 different places. And those are marked here on the map there, the yellow dots. That plan has, has been talked about, but not really actioned. Two years ago, it was put into action when the Lao government announced to its downstream neighbors that it intended to build a mainstream dam in the northeastern Lao. So now we have a different use of the river. We have a hydropower project that's going to cross the mainstream. And what will the consequences be of that? Well, I can tell you is that we know today much more than we did 50 years ago about the impacts of dams. And some of those impacts are well documented. What we do know is that fish migrate. A colleague of mine the other day said, oh, most people think only birds migrate. But yes, fish migrate too. They migrate short and long distances. They migrate in order to be able to breed, and produce eggs, the larva comes downstream, and then the fish return and to the place that they were first conceived. We know that also that many of the migratory fish are the ones that are eaten. So clearly, anything that's going to block a migration is going to have an impact on the fish that live there and the people who depend on it. We have an example already within the Mekong region, a dam that was built 25, 30 years ago. It's one of the major tributaries in the Mekong region. It's called the Mun River Dam. And it was built right at the mouth of the tributary where it joins the Mekong. Many of the upland communities said, well, what about, what about the fish? What about our daily lives? The company said, don't worry. We'll build a fish ladder. We'll build this, and this is the fish ladder here in the front end of the picture. This is a way in which fish can swim, and then they pass through a series of concrete locks and eventually get over the dam. <laughs> <sighs> fish ladder didn't work. Fish didn't go up there. Far too risky, I guess. The only example of where fish ladders work are in North America, and they work for salmon species. These are fast swimming, jumping, aggressive species. We don't have any salmon in the Mekong. We have 1,000 species of fish, but not one of them wanted to use this ladder. When I took this picture, there was no water in it, which is also a prerequisite for a fish ladder. <laughs> so the company's response was, I tell you what, we'll open the gates for three months of the year. We'll allow the fish in the migration season. They opened the gates. It had some impact. The fish started to appear in the upper reaches. Communities wanted more. They said, OK, let's, we'll open it for seven months of the year. They opened the gates for seven months of the year. Fish migrated. And now today, they're considering permanently opening. Once they opened it for seven months of the year, the dam stopped making money. So now it's staying obsolete, but still the impact is being felt. So there's a lesson directly in the Mekong region where we know that fish ladders don't work. A colleague of mine said, look, it's not just about the water. It's not just about the fish. It's about the sand. Sand, and he was excited about that. I'm like, I work for WWF and you're talking about sand. He said, look, let me show you. He went to a place north of where I live in Vientiane, took this picture. In the wet season, 15 meters of sand was deposited here, and you can see this. And this is a feature all along the Mekong. Sand, sediment, nutrients pass down this river. And what's significant about that is where they end up. They end up in the, the delta in Vietnam. And as you can see from this picture here, the front edge of the delta where it meets the sea, you can see this brown smudge. And that's the Mekong River discharging its sed sediment and sand into the sea. But most importantly, it's just refertilized the delta. It's made the delta the most productive place within Vietnam. 50% of staple food crops come from this delta. 17 million people live there. And this delta stays above sea level because the sediment and the sand every year is deposited. So it keeps it above, above the sea level. So again, any decision to put a dam which may alter those flows is going to have an impact on people living downstream. But what's this all about, really? And the reason that dams need to be constructed is because we need energy. We need energy, as we heard, to live in the cities that we're going to become more dependent on as we move forward in the next 40 years. This is a picture of Asia at night. And you can see where the energy hubs are. You can see it's the major cities. And you can also see the areas that are black on the map. 
And these are the areas that are still low in human population. But would it be possible to be able to produce energy through hydropower without having negative impacts on the environment? Is there a win-win where you can switch on your light and there isn't a negative consequence for the people who maybe live near a river if it's a hydropower project that has supplied the electricity for you? The traditional approach to generating hydropower has been through the construction of high wall dams. These are incredibly efficient at producing energy, but in huge quantities. But as you can imagine from this 250 meter high wall dam, there's no way that you're going to get fish up there. There's also acts as a barrier in terms of sediment too. So this is the design that our grandfathers came up with. This is the design that has been tried and tested and has been very successful in producing energy. But what if there was a different model? What if there was another way of harnessing the power of the river, but without having the negative impacts associated with it? There are two considerations, where you put the dam and what kind of hydropower or dam project it is. If this kind of dam is located in the high upstream mountain area, it will have a lot less impact than if you put it lower downstream, just simply because there's less river cut off by that dam. So location is important. But also what's important is the type of hydropower project. <clears throat> Many of the considerations that I've been talking about have appeared in the media over the last two years, ever since Lao announced its intention to build a dam at Saibuli. And it's gone to the highest level of government. And what we had was, just quite recently, was a situation where the premiers of Cambodia and premiers of Vietnam sat down together and they talked about their concerns about the dam. They were concerned about the delta. They were concerned about the fisheries. And they made a public statement and they said to the Lao government, we want you to delay the construction of this dam. We're concerned about its impacts and we want to know more about it. We want to know more about the effects that this dam is going to have. So at the highest level of government, it's been communicated back to the Lao government, please stop, think, and let's find out more about the impacts before you go ahead. That creates an opportunity. That creates the opportunity for a win-win, where you have a delay in decision-making, but you need to find an alternative. We need to find a solution. And there's a 12th project that is proposed for the Mekong, and it's this one. And what it is, is it's harnessing the power of the Mekong, but without providing a barrier. As you can see here, the plan is, is to build a diversion channel. This will be a man-made channel that will take the flow of the river through a series of turbines and put the water back in the river further downstream. That way, there is no impact on fisheries because the fish can still migrate down the, the main mainstream, down the main channel, and there's no disruption in sediment flow. Now, this is a much smaller scale than a 250 meter high wall dam. But what it shows is that there are alternatives. And what it shows is that technology can provide some of the answers that we're looking for. The challenge to industry, the challenge to governments, is to say, look, can we take this model and make it bigger? And can we make it better? And can we make it in such a way that we don't have to compromise the livelihoods of the 60 million people that live in this region? And also that we can have a win-win where we can have food security and energy security in this changing world. And as one of the intro speakers said this morning, the next generation is important. So it's important also that we leave a living planet for the next generation of naturalists to be able to look at a species in wonder or maybe even make a new discovery. Thank you very much. I think this is an idea worth sharing. We don't have to do what our grandfathers did in terms of hydropower development. There is an alternative. Thank you very much.